I'm Fran Voltman. I've been working with all uh, many of you on Keep Farming Northampton, and we're here tonight to present our cumulative report of work that has been done over a very broad area and uh, several years. Uh, some of you are here for the first time tonight, and we'll try to say some things as we go along to bring you up to speed on what we've been doing. Others of you have seen pieces of the work as we've gone along, and we'll have some new materials for you tonight as well. Um, I'm going to um, try to move at a crisp pace, that's why I'm using notes, uh, so that there can be ample time for questions and discussion at the end. <coughs> And we're asking that you hold off your questions and comments until the end, uh, unless there's something you just don't understand on one of the slides or something we say. Um, the overall purpose um, has been, of our project, has been to strengthen Northampton agriculture in ways that are good for farmers, good for businesses, and good for the community. Uh, more specifically, um, to support local agriculture, to look for ways that are both desirable and doable, to make farming more secure, more profitable, and maybe even more enjoyable. Does that work? <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the Northampton food system, uh, to try to look at who the farmers are, what are they growing, where are they selling it? Who's buying it? How does it get to market? All those pieces of a food system. We try to do some evaluations of that. Thirdly, to bridge relationships within the food system, uh, relationships between producers, distributors, consumers, government, businesses, uh, and finally to suggest ways to strengthen the roles of local agriculture and local food as foundations of economic development, sustainability, and community values of access and participation. Uh, <coughs> participants in this project have been many. These are the five major categories of participants. And what I want to do now is to acknowledge and thank all of these people, while at the same time giving you a little history of, of the work that we've done. So first of all, um, the Glenwood Center. <coughs> this project would not have happened without the Glenwood Center and its program, Keep Farming. Keep Farming is a model program for assessing local food systems based on systematic information collected on the ground. Their model provided us with sample surveys that we could uh, change and modify to meet our own needs, and also a path forward. Virginia Kosinki approached us initially to propose that we bring the program to Northampton, and a group of us mounted a public meeting where we found a lot of enthusiasm for moving forward. Since that time, we've had wonderful support from Virginia and from Glib Wood liaisons, Andrea Burns and Melissa Adams, and we'd like for those of you who are here, Virginia, Melissa, I think Melissa is here, please stand up and let us thank you. Maybe I should say, there are going to be a lot of people to thank, so how about if we go through all this and then you thank them all at the end? <laughs> okay. um, so this, the second group is uh, the Northampton Keep Farming Working Group, a number of people that you see here who have worked in many ways on this project. We had survey researchers and statisticians. We had writers and graphic designers and computer wizards and farmers and activists and people of all trades. And uh, we'd like for you to all stand up and get thanked. <laughs> The Agricultural Commission, right after our initial meeting with Glenwood, the Northampton Agricultural Commission agreed to sponsor the project. This was very important for us, and they, along with Wayne Fyden, the Director of Sustainability and Development, um, 
have been consistent in their level of support throughout the project, and we won't make you thank, stand, but we want to thank you. <laughs> uh, next, we have Smith. Oh, and also the Board of Health. Ben Wood helped us out when he was here. Um, next is uh, Smith College. We learned early in the process that Smith College could be an outstanding partner in our work. The Smith Center for Community Collaboration provided basically all of the financial support for this project. Um, and the Center for the Environment, Ecological Design, and Sustainability, otherwise known as SEEDS, SEEDS, uh, mounted a program on local food that we could tap into. In addition to all to the, the faculty members listed here and the students, special studies and intern students, um, I particularly want to recognize the students in the SEEDS Sustainable Food Capstone course. These 10 students who are here tonight have been working so hard over this past semester as kind of one giant mind to move the project forward. They took all of our research they pulled it together, they did extra research of their own, uh, and they are going to be major participants in this program tonight. So I hope you all please stand and be acknowledged. <laughs> and finally, um, I want to thank the uh, some of the other organizations and people who have contributed in some way or another to this project. Uh, CESA, I see that Phil Corman is here. Uh, Grow Food Northampton uh, and others that you can see here. I, I don't know that we've got everybody because it's been a lot of folks, but we're deeply grateful to everybody. And now, at the end of all this, will all of you who have been involved in this stand up and let us clap for you. <laughs> So, methods and research. This has been, at its core, a data gathering project. In keeping with the Glenwood model, we wanted to collect information on the major components of the Northampton food system. So to do this, we designed and conducted four major surveys. First was a survey on farms and farming, also called agricultural economics in which we interviewed 26 farmers about what they grow, where it is sold, and what issues they face in today's economic climate. Second was a survey of Northampton consumers. We surveyed 550 residents, attempting to select a sample of the population based on the 2010 <coughs> Northampton demographic profile. We did a pretty good job of matching the profile, although it wasn't perfect, but we got a lot of very good and interesting data out of that uh, project. Um, we asked about people's buying habits and priorities for putting local food on their tables. Third was a survey of Northampton restaurants. We contacted 72 restaurants, you believe that, 72 restaurants in Northampton, um, and discovered right up front that about half of them notably a group of fast food restaurants, not only do not serve local food, but are prevented by their corporate headquarters from even discussing the sources of their food with us. We were able, however, to survey 38 restaurants regarding the place of local food on their menus and the issues they face in serving it. Reports of all three of these surveys have already been presented to the, um, to the AGCOM, and they exist on the Northampton website, the City of Northampton website, in the Department of Development and Sustainability. But I'll, I'm just gonna pass around these paper copies so that you can just look at them if you'd like. Just, and uh, we like them back, they're the only ones we have. So, <laughs> and you guys have already seen them, so I'll, I'll start over here. Um, Finally, fourth and finally, 
we, uh, the Smith capstone students have completed a survey of Northampton institutions. This, new ma this is new material that none of you have seen and which they will report on tonight. And uh, they too have a paper copy of us of this for, for us to pass around. In addition to the surveys, in addition to the surveys, um, the Keep Farming Northampton group and especially the students have used other reports to elaborate on our findings. We looked, for example, at the Northampton Sustainability Plan and the Conway School Food Security Plan. And as the project moved along over the last several years, we recognized increasingly that although Northampton made an excellent case study for local food, a really useful analysis of our local food system requires a regional approach. We needed to learn what was going on beyond our own city limits. So we also acquired information from sources like the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, the Mass Farm to School Program, and other regional sources. So that's basically the project. And now I, I hope you understand what we've done and where we are, and it's time to see some results. So I want to introduce the two students who will lead us through their research and their work in bringing all this material together. These are the Julias. <laughs> <laughs> Julia Jones and Julia Whiting. Please. Yeah, thank you very much, Fran, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you all for being here tonight. We so appreciate um, your your willingness to come out on at the at the end of the week, and um, we're looking forward to presenting the four four surveys that we've um, been working with. So, without further ado. So we'll start out with the farmers that we surveyed. We were able to get in touch with um, a number of farmers here in Northampton and gathered information, a wide range of information on them. So we found out that 82% of those surveyed, of these, these farmers, um, have been farming for over 25 years. So it's experienced folk that we're dealing with here. 75% um, said that they were satisfied with their farm opera operations as is. 30% um, say they were interested in permanently protecting their land. So. Um, regardless of whether or not that they were comfortable with their current production, they wanted to make sure that um, they, they conserve their land um, for generations to come. 60% uh, sold half or more of their produce in Northampton, which is a pretty fantastic number, um, keeping in mind that that's just the, the participants in the survey itself. 30% um, sell some or all of their products at a farmer's market or a farm stand. Um, which is also notable. Um, in order to bring this into context, uh, we decided to look at the land resources that Northampton um, is pulling on. So um, we, again, we, we surveyed 26 active farmers. Um, they were working with 2,600 acres worth of farmland that's in production, which is 11% of the land in Northampton as a whole. Um, the average size of each farm is 24 acres, and um, four owners, it's important to remember, own 100 acres or more. Um, so there are a couple of people who have, are doing quite a lot of farming, quite a big swatch of land. Um, if you compare that to the Pioneer Valley, and um, put Pioneer, the Pioneer Valley in the context of Massachusetts as a whole, um, we find that um, there are nearly 2,000 farms in, in the Pioneer Valley alone. Um, I remember driving down to Smith and my mom saying, this is the bread basket. This used to be the bread basket of Massachusetts and one of the bread bas baskets of New England. And that was really powerful for me. Um, and there is a lot of farming going on here. 169,000 acres are, are in production. Um, that's 14% of the land in the Pioneer Valley. Um, that's 33% of the farmland in Massachusetts as a whole and 25% of the farms in Massachusetts are right here in, in the valley. Um, the average size is about 50 acres, which is twice as large as the average farm in Northampton. 
Um, so, but we are right up there. 11% of the land um, in Northampton is in production, and 14% of the land in the Pioneer Valley as a whole is in production. We believe that there's definitely room for growth there. So, and then also looking at um, what's actually being grown uh, here in the municipality, we find that four major crops are in production. So that's potatoes, um, corn for feed, hay, and soybeans. Um, so that's something that we didn't really expect going into the surveys, but did pop up. Um, it's important to keep in mind that um, the people who participated, you know, it's, we didn't get to survey everyone, but this is a good representation of, of what is being grown here. That means that, so 575 acres are in potatoes, 514 in feed corn, um, 343 acres for hay, um, and soybeans are 103. So thinking about um, the crops to the, to the right here, those are not going directly to human cons consumption, but rather going through an animal and then to human consumption. Um, and most of these over here are not um, being consumed here in Northampton for the most part. They're going outside of the municipality. Um, so 50% of those, uh, or 150, sorry, 1,000, just over 1,500 acres are in production um, for these four crops, which represents 50% of the farmland in, in Northampton, which is considerable. So a big part of these surveys was looking at barriers to local food and producing for the local market. Um, so for farmers, we found that um, just in general, some of the challenges that they face or the high cost of fuel, that's like the numero uno. Um, next after that is state and federal regulations, um, which come up in a number of our other surveys as well. Uh, insurance concerns, as well as theft, trespassing, and vandalism. One person mentioned that they lost a considerable amount of money in just one night of someone taking a joyride through their, their fields, which is something that um, is, uh, you know, something really serious to take into consideration as well. Um, Availability and cost of farmland, which is, is really key here. Property values in Northampton, as we all know, are, are high and, and taxes are high as well. And so this is another issue for people who are um, looking at selling their farmland or entering into, into the industry, starting up their own farm. Um, and another part of it is land use laws. So that's another barrier. Finally, marketing and distribution of, of food. So maybe not the growing of it, but but getting it to market and um, getting into our homes. So in looking at this whole survey, something you know that we, we pulled away is that Northampton is in the center of an active farming community, um, rich with natural resources. So we have this incredible you know, river bottom soil that's fantastic, and we have a lot of farming going on here, and that's something we'd like to, to connect with. So. All right, now we're going to take a look, a brief look at the consumer survey. Um, and we're going to start off with a profile of the Northampton consumer who is most likely to go out of their way to buy local food. We went through it and we thought, all right, who is really going out of their way for this? Um, and the top groups are women over 50, college graduate women, and households with incomes over $75,000 a year. Uh, there's a lot of overlap as well between these. Um, so for women over 50 with a college degree who also have a great household income. I Smith College. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Smith College is skewing. The <laughs> All right, and so then looking at where are Northamptonites buying their food, 75% um, reported buying at least some of their food from super supermarkets. Not a complete surprise. 22% uh, reported buying at least some of their food from large retailers such as Walmart. 42% reported going to farmers markets, which is great, that's almost half, and 32% reported participating in CSAs, which is another fantastic statistic. It's important to keep those in mind that um, this is just the respondents to our surveys, yes. not all the residents of Northampton, but it does give you a really cool look at um, the buying habits of, of people here yes. in the community. Uh, so now taking a look at interest, 68% um, of respondents, again, uh, buy local every week, 88% always or sometimes check to see if their food is local, 
58% go out of their way to get local food in the growing season, and again, 42% shop at farmers markets, which means there's already a huge effort among certain segments of the population to make sure local food is bought and is cooked with. And we looked at reasons for purchasing local food, and some of the top responses were supporting local farms, which is key. Um, the belief that local is fresher and healthier, and that 69% think that buying local helps preserve the environment, quote, a lot. <laughs> um, so there's a variety of reasons, but supporting local agriculture is at the top, and we are living in a community that really cares about its farmers and wants to make sure that they're doing all right. So the top consumer challenges here, and it's important to remember that 63% when first asked this question said nothing prevented them from buying local, um, but when pressed, 42% uh, think that local food is too expensive. Uh, and an important word here is think. Local food isn't necessarily always more expensive, but there's definitely a perception out there that it is. And another issue is access. 30% uh, uh, reported that access to where local food is sold presents some sort of difficulty for them. Uh, but that is a relatively low <laughs> percent compared to the interest that we're seeing. So our takeaway from this is that Northampton consumers want local food on the table. They have the means, the motive, and the opportunity to bring a lot of local food into their households. Awesome. So again, we had the opportunity to speak with lots of restaurateurs, and I know that there was a lot of knocking on doors to get this survey to come to fruition, um, but we're happy to synthesize the data of 38 restaurants who participated in our survey. Um, that was out of 72 in total. Again, um, Fran mentioned earlier that there was a difficulty in, in gathering information from restaurant chains, but we were able to get information from delicatessens, cafes, small restaurants, fine din dining restaurants. So just kind of a wide range of, of different, um, you know, restaurants in Northampton. Um, we found that each one on average is selling 100 to 300 meals per day. Um, and in total, nor these 38 restaurants are serving well over 6,000 um, meals per day. So if you scale that up to include the, se you know, the 72 other restaurants that weren't included here, there's a, there are a lot of uh, plates of food being produced in, in Northampton. It's, it's considerable. Um, so going on to the next slide, we found that 90%, 90%, almost all of these restaurants found that local is important to clients, reflecting the interest <laughs> we talked about um, in the consumer survey, and that um, it's also good for business. So it's, that's really a two-pronged question there. It's not only is it that the clients want it, but it's also good, it's a good part of their business, and it's an important part of their business and their identity. Um, and 80% express an interest in purchasing local food, which is fantastic. That being said, like all of the other um, consumers of local food in the Valley and in Northampton, they do fe face some barriers. So, or, um, you know, the, we'll, we'll go into the next slide, but um, the most important parts for them when buying local food or making food purchasing decisions were freshness, quality, price, and availability. And when you think about local food, freshness and quality are pretty pretty strong right there. So, so the challenges that these restaurants are facing really come um, into play when it comes to marketing. So many of these restaurants don't have the time or they don't put the, the, the time and energy into marketing local foods that are on the menu. Um, so many times people walk into a restaurant and don't even know that they're eating local potatoes. Uh, and Cons they also struggle with this consumer perception of the high cost of, of local food and the high, high price, um, so that can be a deterrent for, for many, um, you know, customers. Um, seasonal availability is also a strong issue. Many people want to serve, you know, a delicious strawberry dessert in February, and that's not necessarily a reality um, at this point in time with our food system that we're working with. Um, the next part is that they need regular, reliable del delivery that's not a hassle for them to arrange. They needed to, you know, the restaurant business is very fast paced. Um, they need a just in time inventory, and um, oftentimes, you know, working with local farms, that, that part is a little bit more of a challenge to make happen. So the pull away is that um, Northampton restaurants are definitely into local food. They, they know it's important for their businesses. The thing is that if they want to bring more in, it needs to be convenient and it needs to be brought to them. Um, 
the local food needs to be brought to the local, you know, the local restaurant. So um, that's kind of our takeaway from the surveys. So. Okay, now moving on to the institutional survey, which is the survey that the Smith Capstone course administered. Um, we administer, uh, administered the survey to 10 institutions. Uh, we asked 13 to participate, 10 got back to us. And these were hospitals, nursing homes, educational institutions, and penal facilities. Um, and of these institutions, 50% report feeling interested to very interested in local food. Um, so even among institutions, at least half of them are, uh, they have local food on their brains. 70% uh, report serving some local foods, so that's already the vast majority. 40% uh, actively seek out local food. And all of these institutions together are serving more than 10,000 meals per day. So they are a major, major producer of plated meals in the municipality. Something we totally did not think about. Just 10 no. institutions. Remember that we surveyed uh, 27 for the restaurants and um, you know the, the institutions are right there at just 10 institutions. So. Right, so taking a quick look at their budgets because price has been a concern for everyone and the institutions are the same. Uh, collectively, these institutions spend almost $800,000 on locally grown food, um, and this was just in the last year. And the budgets definitely range, however, most institutions have budgets that are over $300,000 a year for food alone. Um, and it's important, I think, here to highlight that the amount of local food, of money spent on local food, really varies from institution to institution. And contrary to expectation, size of food budget does not determine how much local food is being purchased. Um, the institution that buys proportionally the most local food, they spend the most amount of their budget on it, is the institution with one of the smallest budgets out of the entire sample. Um, and also important to look at is that it is, it's a retirement and nursing facility, which means that they're serving a high-risk population that has very specific concerns. And down here we have another retirement nursing facility with a much larger food budget that is spending even less money on local food. Um, so price means a lot, but they're clearly, some are making it work despite that. So looking at some of the institutional challenges, uh, they require large amounts of food. They serve in bulk, they cook in bulk. But as we saw earlier, they're putting out over 10,000 meals a day collectively, and that's a lot of food. Um, the second is, what we call labor in a box, um, that a lot of institutions work with pre-processed foods such as pre-chopped zucchini or pre-peeled squash. That's labor in a box because that means that that is in hours that someone has to hand peel and chop hundreds of squash. That's a lot of work and many of these institutions simply don't have the resources to devote to that. Uh, again, like restaurants, they need a regular reliable deliveries. Most of these institutions set their menus months in advance, if not a year in advance. So when they have planned a meal for a specific food, they need that food there. And the final barrier that we saw was state and federal regulations that end up often impeding local purchasing. And this could be anything from extremely strict health and safety regulations for institutions serving high-risk populations, or very specific contracts that institutions get locked into that prevent them from buying food from a number of different sources. Um, but this was a, a huge challenge for many of those surveyed. But our, our takeaway here is really that institutions are Northampton's untapped market. There's a lot of money there and there's a huge amount of room for expansion. Some of these institutions are only spending $5,000 a year out of their over $300,000 annual food budget on local food and that is huge room to expand. All right, so now we're going to look at the way we've summarized all of these findings. Uh, first, looking at the level of interest. And what we noticed is that there are very high levels of interest in Northampton among all of the consuming players in our food system. Uh, in restaurants, 80% of managers were interested in local food, and around 70% of chefs were. And that's really important to see that we need the support of both sides, those who are buying the food and those who are cooking it because that is a partnership. And again, in terms of institutions, 80% of institutional food directors are very interested in local food, and 60% of chefs in institutions are interested in local food as well. 
and then looking down to consumers, 93% feel that buying local helps the local economy. So local is very present in everyone's minds, and many people are very interested in it. And we just want to highlight briefly that in terms of consumers, we know that the Be a Local Hero campaign of CISAs has really helped um, keep local food in consumers' minds when they go to the grocery store. If they see that mark, then they know. And at least, even if they don't buy it, they're thinking about it. So also, another key part here is that we really wanted to say, you know, get an idea of the kind of food <coughs> money that's, that's you know, pooled here in Northampton. So um, in order to get an idea of that, uh, first we looked at the sheer number of meals that are being served. So between restaurants and institutions, we have well over 16,000 meals being served daily. I want to emphasize that this is a rock bottom number um, and no, by no means represents kind of the depth or the, the you know, the quantity of seed meals being served by, um, you know, those people we couldn't survey. Um, so this is just a very minimum number, still a lot of, lot of meals. 9,900, almost 10,000 of those meals are being served by institutions alone, which harkens back to our idea that the institutions really are an untapped market that we, we don't discuss enough and are a fantastic um, place to expand for local food. Um, and so then just looking at the number of dollars being spent here, you'll see that restaurants um, are spending $4.5 million on food. Institutions, $3 million. Residents, well, well, well over $4.3 million. This is, um, these are very conservative estimates, but um, the respondents um, together are spending um, nearly $12 million on, on food. Uh, annually, which is incredible um, to think about. Um, and again, that's just the bottom of the barrel. And um, we really feel strongly that, um, that local food could be a driver of our economy in Northampton. It's not something that you can send overseas. It's not something that can leave the valley. If you can um, tap into this market, I think there's great potential for a multiplier effect in our economy. So now we're going to run through briefly the common barriers that we saw because it's actually really interesting that among all four surveys, uh, several themes kept coming up and just occurring repeatedly. And we gave uh, six different names to them, uh, but these appeared in almost every survey. Uh, the first is seasonal availability, and this is what can we get when? Um, and part of this is also understanding that there is local food available in November. It's there, and uh, but however, some people just don't understand that. Uh, another was relationships. Um, there's a lot of gaps between people who want to buy local food but don't know where or who to go to. Uh, institutions who aren't sure uh, what farmer could best supply them with, say, tomatoes or something like that. Um, but there's a lot of instances where just introducing two people to each other would really get business going. It's a human connection there yeah. as well. It's not just a database with, with information. It's a relationship, someone there to make that bond happen. All right, so another was uh, distribution, processing, and storage. Uh, both restaurants and institutions really needed, uh, they expressed interest in regular, reliable deliveries. Um, so working on distribution, processing, um, getting things that are at least minimally processed, uh, and readily available for people, and as well as storage. Uh, if people want to work with extending the season and preserving foods, they need somewhere to put it. Uh, another is the perceived price of local. As we saw in both the consumer and restaurant survey, there's a perception of a high price associated with local food, which might not necessarily actually be there. Uh, another is awareness and access to information. Um, as I stated previously, some people don't understand when local food is available, when it's in season. Um, where to go, the fact that we have a winter farmer's market, things like this that could be fairly readily remedied if we just gave people a little bit more information. And finally, state and federal rules and regulations cropped up multiple times, um, which is, of course, not something that necessarily we're going to be able to change. Uh, Congress is particularly finicky, and I don't know if <laughs> just we could change that, but it's something to keep in mind, that this is a common barrier mm -hmm. that's uh, recurring and this is a challenge for many people. I'm sure that's something that's echoed in, in your minds as well. It's um, not, we can't fix all of these barriers, but 
we've come up with some um, recommendations that will at least address them and work on them in, in, the, in the long term. So uh, my name is Adele Franks and I am very pleased to join our Smith student colleagues in uh, presenting recommendations based on our findings. The students uh, went uh, way beyond the call of duty to look for examples from other locations and other states of things um, that demonstrate uh, how to revitalize or strengthen um, local agriculture. So um, we so we have grouped our recommendations. We're going to um, well, we're going to talk about approximately ten uh, recommendations. And just to uh, go back for a second, well, we, one of the things we realized in the course of this four years that we've been working on this project is that Northampton is really too small of a, of a location to focus on, that we really have to have more of a regional perspective. And so all of the recommendations that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, we intend to be um, implemented uh, in collaboration with other regional organizations, such as the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, CESA, and other agricultural commissions and others. Um, so moving on to our recommendations, we have grouped them into three categories. One is those that are directly related to economic development, those that are um, very much tied to the need to share information, and those that require um, municipal support. So moving into economic development, we, we think Northampton is really uh, poised to become a local food destination. Um, there's just no reason not, not to pursue that. We have the interest, we have a lot of restaurants, and um, if we do pursue this in a vigorous fashion, we think this could be a real economic driver with a ripple effect to all the other businesses in downtown Northampton. So uh, first and foremost of our recommendations is that Northampton really needs to have a permanent farmer's market. Uh, it would. Uh, ideally be a publicly owned facility or at the very least have a very long-term lease agreement so, uh, so it has some security. It would be a year-round facility so there would be plenty of indoor space not only uh, for farmers markets but to serve many other purposes as well that we're going we're gonna to go into uh, in, in the next couple of minutes. And uh, it could serve you know not only food, would primarily serve food related um, activities, uh, workshops and events, uh, but also other types of community events could be held in this space if it were as beautiful as this one. <laughs> and uh, clearly, uh, we think it needs to be accessible and centrally located. And so we think that the ideal place for this would be in the Roundhouse yes. property. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or nearby. <laughs> we thought that would happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So we, I mean, you can speak yes. to the Eastern Market yes. specifically. So looking at, this is actually a photo of Eastern Market in Detroit. And just as a wonderful example of how a permanent farmer's market can have a positive effect, um, not only for farmers and consumers, but for an entire neighborhood. Um, this is a market that's located in Detroit, which we all know is bankrupt and having a lot of problems. However, the neighborhood that hosts this market is rich and vibrant. This market has brought a host of restaurants all around it. Um, it's really a booming business, uh, not only on the Saturdays during the Tuesday markets, and it brings people in from as far as 45 minutes away. Um, my family, I live 40 minutes away from Detroit, and we go in regularly. So it's, it can be a huge draw and really revitalize an area, especially if it can work in Detroit, it can work in Northampton. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> What's terrific too is we saw, you know, we talked about distribution quite a bit, and um, it's kind of one of those ideas that if you build it, they will come. And in Detroit, that's happened. So we see all of these distribu distributors, all these like, you know, small family businesses that have cropped up right around you know, this fantastic resource. Yes. And, and so you've got all these businesses right there. So right at the end of the day, um, when I know I work at the kitchen garden farm, I put too many vegetables back on a truck to go back north of the highway. So if those could end up in a truck being sent off with a distributor to an institution, um, which is happening at, you know, at the, the market here in Detroit, then that's something that could happen in, in Northampton as well. So 
Um, you can see in another example is Ithaca, New York, um, which is another college town with a similar size. Detroit is, is different from, from Northampton, um, certainly, but Ithaca is very similar and they have this, uh, this fantastic farmer's market that people come from m miles out of state to go to, um, which is something that Adele and I have, have discussed um, in meetings past, but that's something to really think about. It's just attracting people into Northampton is, is a great day trip or a weekend vacation. So one of the things that could be housed in this permanent farmer's market is a small-scale minimal food processing facility, which could peel and chop and package and um, freeze and store uh, vegetables in a convenient form uh, so that it could be, they could be used out of season, so that our restaurants and institutions could be using local produce out of season very conveniently. And, um, we, we also envision this uh, as a local food community center, and all of this could be housed theoretically in a permanent farmer's market structure. But at the local food community center, we could have community workshops and networking nights, both of which we're going to talk a little bit about later, as well as different activities from PV Grows, and it, also business development workshops to really help out farmers who are looking to expand their business in various ways. Yeah, a lot of this stuff is already happening. Um, and you get an email in, in a listserv, right? And then you have no idea where it's going to be held. Um, and it might be quite a drive from downtown. And this would be a fantastic way of bringing everybody into one place for all these cool activities that are going on with it, whether it's with PB Grows or CESA or, um, you know, a local business de development, you know, organization, something like that, all in one place. Um, so you might see a spike of, you know, community involvement in, in food and agriculture. So uh, there are a lot of ways to promote local food, and uh, one of them would be to have a look, uh, sponsor a local food week in Northampton. And I'm sure you all could think of you know dozens of things you would include in a local food week. But these are some of the ideas that, that we came up with. One is you know have the restaurants competing with each other to produce the best menu based on um, local ingredients. Uh, you could even have uh, chef competitions where they have the same ingredients and have to come up with different different kinds of dishes. <laughs> that sounds fun, fun to me anyway. And you know, we have, uh, we have local uh, publications that could be uh, giving awards uh, to restaurants where uh, the diners are uh, voting them to be the, the best at providing creative uh, menus with local food. Uh, we envision a lively food and farming film festival. There are lots of lots of films that have uh, food themes, as well as serious films about food, and uh, likewise about farming. Uh, there could be uh, uh, book groups that we could sponsor readings of uh, food-related books and hold uh, conversations at the library. We could uh, have food-related lectures, workshops, and, and all kinds of uh, interesting demonstrations. And it could culminate in some kind of a big celebration, which could highlight farmers' products, uh, show, showcase their products, uh, hold CSA drives. Um, I'm envisioning um, you know, music and art as well and have it be quite a draw. You know, the Garlic and Arts Festival, which is only a couple of days in Orange, Massachusetts, draws people from all over the state of Massachusetts. And then it involves a lot of food, a lot of art, and a lot of music, and it's very successful. So, I'm Despite the bad parking and, <laughs> and locations, though. So. Well, we think Northampton would be a wonderful location to have a, a local food week, something that would really stretch out and bring people here. Now we know from our survey that the people who are the most likely to go out of their way to buy local food are the people who uh, are high income and high in education. And uh, so there have been some efforts here in Northampton to make sure that we're reaching uh, people who aren't so fortunate with um, and giving them access to fresh, healthy local food. And that's been the, the, the so-called Snap Times 2 program that the Tuesday Market initiated where uh, through private donations, people's uh, SNAP cards are then doubled in value at the farmer's market. And uh, they, the Tuesday market has done a great job of bringing in those uh, folks, SNAP recipients. And it's been very, very popular. In fact, they often are on the brink of running out of money to continue the program. Now, unfortunately, 
the fundraising is really just a couple of people doing it, and, and it's, there's no sustained effort. We would like to see the, uh, the, SNAP, the doubling of SNAP to become an existing sustainable um, program that we could expand and rely upon, which would require you know, aggressive fundraising on a continual basis. Um, we can certainly take advantage of having something like a local food week, have, having uh, local restaurants donate a portion of their profits for that week to this program. We can become part of the hundreds of, of uh, calls and emails that we're all getting today about Valley Gives Day tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But mostly what this program needs is an institutional sponsor. It, it can't rely on two people. Uh, it, 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 it just can't. It's not going to, uh, my prediction is it's not going to be sustainable. And, um, and, I, and I don't think it could possibly grow. There have been some preliminary conversations between um, the farmers market managers, as I understand it, and some city representatives with the United Way uh, as an organization who could take on this program permanently. And I, uh, one of our recommendations is to vigorously pursue that and build on what's already started and see whether that could really become sustainable. Another possibility um, is uh, CISA is another organization uh, it's dear to our hearts that could do this. <coughs> but ultimately, we'd like to see this become a sustainable situation, perhaps even with an endowment, um, something, something of a sufficient magnitude that it could be housed in an account at the Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts, which has the advantage of doing all of the, has the capacity to do the administrative work so that uh, if the United Way or CISA were running the program, they would not be burdened with the uh, receiving the checks, uh, dispersing the money, thanking the donors, <coughs> sending out tax uh, confirmations. All the administrative work would be done by the Community Foundation. Okay, so one problem that came up uh, for farmers, for restaurants as well, um, is marketing and letting people know when local food is being sold. And we thought that working with supermarkets would be a great way because in our class's research, we discovered a group called the Pioneer Valley Growers Association who is selling to many supermarkets who are then putting the produce out on the floor with no label. So consumers are buying local produce without <laughs> even knowing they're buying local produce. And we thought to work with supermarkets <coughs> to actively label and highlight their local foods could then in turn promote more purchasing of it as we saw there's a lot of interest and if people know it's local, they're more likely to purchase it. So we thought consistent labeling of all local food in supermarkets, as well as perhaps a special section so people know exactly where to go when they walk in the doors, they see it there. And also perhaps to work in conjunction with the local food week and really promote the products that they have there and feature them prominently. Because if um, it's made more visible and uh, really put out in the forefront, people will know that they can buy that and that yes, that squash that they've been getting for years actually has been coming out of the valley and they didn't even know it. Our prediction is that the grocery stores will get more interested in stocking local food when they see that it's actually more popular. Mm -hmm. So now moving into informational sharing. Yeah, certainly. So our idea is when we spoke with all of these 10 institutions, we all sat down as a group of the Capstone students here and had lengthy conversations with food service directors and chefs. Something that came up was, um, was the issue of bringing local food to scale in an institutional setting where budgets are tight. They have strict regulations, not only from the state um, and from the U.S. government, but also from their, the corporation that runs the local facility or um, regarding health, um, if they're serving an at-risk risk population. Um, contract requirements, things of that nature. They speak the same language and they share the same barriers to local food. That being said, there are some uh, food service directors, Ken Toon over at UMass, we have um, Kathy Zaja at Smith who has done some really stellar stuff. Um, bringing those kind of people together during a networking night so that they can communicate the struggles they're facing, some, you know, share creative solutions, uh, brainstorm and make connections um, will be a great way to move past some of these barriers and kick the door open where people are beginning to buy a little bit of lo local food. So we said earlier that 70% of the institutions we surveyed are buying at least some local food 
we can kick that door open um, and, and increase that, that um, percentage of their food budget, that would be fantastic. And we think this would be a great way to do it. We think that they, this type of um, networking night should um, involve workshops hosted by Massachusetts Farm to School and Farm to Institution New England, which I think um, Julia can speak to well because she's involved as an intern. Yes, so. uh, these are two really wonderful nonprofits that already exist that work specifically to connect farmers with institutions. Uh, Mass Farm to School, for example, provides free technical assistance, which means matching uh, the right farmer to the right institution and making that connection and then helping figure out menus, <coughs> helping work out delivery schedules, as well as negotiating prices that are fair to, that are fair to farmers and will support them. Um, and these are already organizations that are working together and doing really wonderful things, and to bring them into this and show institutions what resources are available to them, we think would be really helpful and encouraging. Another piece of that is that once you've identified a farm, there would be a really good match to an institution. It could be a nursing home. Um, if the food service director says, I'm game, and the farm says, I'm game, but they've got regulations in the way, we want to have um, a salaried farm to fork, fork um, regulations liaison right there to help them um, <coughs> hold their hand, the farmer, um, through those regulations. Um, and we think that would be something that um, could be supported uh, through one of our, you know, local food-oriented organizations. So the next piece is um, we saw it in all of our consumer surveys this this interest in local food. Um, so we think, like we mentioned earlier, that could be an engine for growth in the local food economy. And um, in order to harness that and bring people together and, and create a dialogue, um, a strong dialogue regarding local food, we could have community workshop, workshops that um, would provide kind of a number of different you know, skills and, and different things you can speak to specifically. Yeah, um, we were thinking about, uh, for example, cross-cultural cooking classes to really bring the community together and show them what ingredients are available and how to cook with them, as well as healthy seasonal menu planning. Uh, a barrier we found is that people don't understand what foods are available for harvest at what times of the year. So if there was a workshop to say, all right, well, this is what's growing in November, and these are the menu options, look at these fabulous meals you can still create, that would really help people and give them that extra push to actively pursue this. Um, as well as shopping for local food on a budget. Not everyone is a college-educated woman over 50 with a household income of $75,000 a year. <laughs> and for that reason, we would really want to promote workshops that help people make ends meet and make sure that they can incorporate local food, which consumers identify as healthier and fresher, even if their budgets are a bit smaller. And this is exactly the sort of thing that would do really well in a permanent farmer's market structure. Um, because if these reach out to all different segments of the population, and if it's in a central, walkable location uh, that people understand is the source for this sort of knowledge, it's a lot easier to just take that couple block walk over there and find out what's going on. Certainly, certainly. We found that we were searching for the community center in Northampton and what we came across was the senior center, which is certainly a fantastic thing, but um, we really think that a community center would serve a great purpose and this is yeah. you know, something that could be housed there. So. Um, now looking at the mobile marketplace app, which is something Julia and I are really excited about, <laughs> um, we thought about coming up with a program that would directly connect farmers and restaurateurs and institutional food buyers. And it would be a mobile application as well as connecting to an online platform. Um, because Julia, you know that farmers work with Yes. Um, right? <laughs> I work at the Kitchen Garden Farm and I, I swear to God, they. Uh, Tim and Caroline don't leave the farm or leave the farmhouse for that matter without an iPhone on them. So they're, they do a lot of business on their iPhone. They receive orders, they um, update orders, they um, are in constant con contact with their customers. Um, the beauty of the smartphone um, and Tim and Caroline are certainly not alone in this farming community of using the, the iPhone um, technology heavily. 
is that they don't have to be chained to a desk inside. They can be making updates out in the field and, um, and that you know, adds mobility and flexibility to their work day. The same thing on the other side for chefs and um, restaurateurs and institutional directors. Just having an online stream, streamlined um, electronic ordering program is so key because uh, they have access to it through um, you know, distribution services. Um, like Fresh Point, U.S. Foods, um, even Upper, you know, you've got Black River Produce has an online um, service. It's really important, um, and in a lot of ways, local food isn't there yet um, with, with that piece. We think this would be a great way to facilitate more purchasing. Yeah, and to make it more convenient for all players, because convenience was an issue. If we streamline the process, there are fewer roadblocks that come up. Um, and we looked at possibilities for this to promote further engagement between Smith and the Greater Northampton community, the Smith College Computer Science Department is chock full of student programmers who are just itching to get some practical experience. Um, and they have all sorts of classes in maintaining databases and programming mobile apps. So that is a unique resource where a student intern could just develop a user interface. And that's step one. And a student got experience, and the city got a really wonderful program and so that everyone wins in that combination. Mm -hmm. I might mention that um, some entrepreneurs are, have already started working on developing this kind of thing, and that they're in various stages of development, and there are some parts of the state where some of these systems are actually in use. Um, so there's something to build on. We're not really starting from nothing. Okay, so on to municipal support. Um, we think it's uh, uh, very important for uh, our city to continue to aggressively address the issues of farmland preservation and protection from dumping and vandalism, um, which is uh, a difficult problem, particularly in the Meadows area. And we also think that uh, in line with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's recent report on uh, food security, in which it recommended that uh, currently non-agricultural land be converted to agricultural <coughs> production to meet future needs and future uncertainties in the valley. Uh, we would like to recommend um, that our city look for opportunities to bring underutilized land into agricultural production. And the, the recommendations that we've, we've made uh, so far tonight uh, all, pretty much all, to some extent, uh, require municipal support and enthusiasm, but none uh, more than uh, the creation of a permanent farmer's market, which could help promote agricultural tourism and um, uh, boost downtown businesses as well. Uh, we think, you know, that one, uh, without municipal support, that one's dead on arrival, so. Uh, it's something that's been echoed in many of the other reports that we've looked into. It's been thought through. Um, and it's something that, you know, just this weekend the farmer's market was moved from, if not from one place to another, from one building to another on Saturday. Um, and even that has an effect and, and it creates instability for farmers and it also creates, um, you know, a lack of consumer confidence as well that it will be there next Saturday. Um, it was canceled once, as we all know, right um, between the start, the end of the fall market and the beginning of the second, you know, the winter market and um, really feel that the, it's time has come for, for a permanent structure. And then finally, um, the doubling of SNAP benefits is something that uh, will also require some assistance from the city. It's very unlikely to become institutionalized uh, in a, in, with a local nonprofit um, without some help from the, from the city. We have you know, too many different people involved in the farmer's market management system uh, we really are going to need city leadership to uh, bring that into fruition. So now we would like to open it up, open up for questions. discussion. Certainly. Okay. So we're ready for questions and discussion. Yes. Have two real quick ones. We're not going to hear you unless you stand up. Excuse me. Okay. Well, maybe you we can mind we'll standing up? We'll, we can repeat it for We'll try to repeat. We'll try to repeat. Yes. Two quick questions. Did the project include a conversation with local board of assessors? 
I think that yeah, some here, communities but, find Did them. the project include a conversation with the local board of assessors? And the answer is no. <laughs> I think that is worth pursuing as the project goes forward okay. because, as you know, they hold a, an important role in assessing the value of 61A opportunities and so on. Yes. So, Second uh, I, could I just repeat your comment that the Board of Assessors is important in um, talking about things, for example, like the value of, of, of uh, 61A properties and things like that. Let me elaborate. I received you a complaint from a term. farmer. I received a complaint from a farmer recently who has spent a lot of time and effort building a beautiful farm stand on his property. And he is his taxes have increased because he's because the value of his property is increasing. Down the road, his neighbor is marketing for free at the farmer's market. And he simply asked if someone would please consider local conversations about that dynamic which we set up when we structure local taxes on agricultural improvements. The second quick question I was going to ask was, did the project include, did, did you touch on the base of, on the topic of food waste? We did. Who who would like to comment on that? Not, well, the question. Um, yeah. did we did we do anything about the problem of food waste? Yes. Not that was something that we didn't cover as much. Our our project was admittedly focused on food supply issues, um, and it is important to note that waste is the whole other half of the food system. Um, however, there has been already some interest in next year's capstone tackling that issue. All right. Yeah, Paul's very interested, Paul Wetzel. <laughs> we didn't really get to mention, but who has been an ex a really, really big part of all of this research. We could not have done, um, you know, if not the research, then the synthesis of the research. We could have not have done it without him, and he's away to conference, but he's been a really fantastic part of, of this whole process, and he is interested in doing a whole capstone dedicated just, just to waste food system. Thank you. Um, if people are interested in that, Ken Toon, the director of food at UMass, has been doing really interesting things with food waste. Um, and he actually discovered that for him, it's 50% less expensive. So he spends 50% less sending it to the compost, um, to a, a farm that uses the, I don't know, New England Farmers Association, small New England Farmers Association or whatever. Um, they use it, and it's, it's way less expensive than sending it to the landfill. So that's what I know about. Okay. <laughs> More questions or comments? You're welcome them. Phil? So I'm Phil Corman. I'm the director of CESA. And I just want to say, incredible job, really. A, a lot of work went into this. And um, a lot of things that you're thinking about sort of reinforces conversations that are going on up and down the valley and throughout New England. So you obviously have hit upon all the issues because. And you're bringing fresh energy to it. So that's really, really great. Um, so very quickly, I'd say a couple of things. One, I think the permanent farmer's market is really interesting. Maybe the next step is to see you know, some kind of assessment, whether it's actually possible with the population base you have. Ithaca is different than here because it clearly is the only draw in that area. Whereas here, we have Greenfield, we have Amherst, we have Northampton. Amherst has talked about this idea a lot. So it doesn't mean it's not possible. You know, you can repeat something that someone thought five years ago, and you might be successful with it, even though five years ago it couldn't move. So don't let people dissuade you, but you know, maybe the next step, if that's the most exciting concrete thing you want to move on, it would be great to do some kind of economic analysis about it, about the population base and that. Um, I love the idea of Northampton Local Food Week. Some pieces of this have happened in some ways. CISA does a restaurant week. Um, part of the challenge is choosing a time that works for the businesses. We chose end of August, mid-August, because that's when business was really slow for them. They didn't need to be highlighted at other times, nor did we do much in way of being successful in mid-August. So, um, so anyway, so there's been some attempt. The double up food stamp benefits, I always go back and forth between shouldn't we be, there was a, um, a research study being completed in Hamden County by the USDA called the Healthy Incentives Pro uh, 
project, and that was basically looking if you gave folks on food stamps 30% back when they bought produce, would they increase the amount of produce they bought? It wasn't focused on local per se, but I'm always torn a little bit about us um, raising money privately versus changing public policy. So, mm -hmm. and there's maybe both need to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also, you know, other farmers markets that do a good job about raising money also. So we've thought about doing a regional fund. Um, still would like to consider it. Part of the challenge is a lot of things around equity. Do you give the same amount to a farmer's market that doesn't raise as much? They may need it more. So there's a lot of things to think about that. Um, and I think we need to keep thinking about it because clearly we don't want it to be a gourmet ghetto local food. And so what we need to do is increase the purchasing power of folks who are on food stamps so the farmers can get the price they need to get. And everybody has access to the food that is grown in their community. Um, Promoting local food in supermarkets. It's a great idea. As you know, a lot of uh, some supermarkets, like River Valley Market, does an amazing job. Um, Big Y is a member of the Local Hero Program. Uh, Stop and Shop is not. To me, in a supermarket, you can have incredible impact. Um, they often say if you just have 10 people visit your local congress, congressman or woman, you can impact that person's voting record. Well, have 10 people go visit the produce manager and you can have a lot of impact. So um, we've been doing, along with Farm, uh, Farm to School, Massachusetts Farm to School, both organizations have been highlighting two produce items a month and are continuing to do that through April. Um, and we've been first working with the supermarkets and the local stores and then spreading it to consumers. And supermarkets are where most people buy their food. It's just true, and it's the toughest nut to crack because of the quantities that they need to buy, the distribution change where they get it, um, and the corporate culture. All right, I'm just going to stop talking except to say one thing. Um, it's really neat. We issued a report this week called Eat Up and Take Action for Local Food, and you've done it already. So um, I'm going to pass it around. I, I have about five copies, but please return the color one. And you can get it at buylocalfood.org for free. Just download it. So great work. Thanks, Phil. And I, uh, I actually wrote to Margaret today and said, bring some of that yeah. new report you just did so that we can share it with this group. So thanks for doing that, too. Um, yes, Mary. I had an idea for the Smith students that want to do the local app, which is a really cool idea. I've been... Um, working on fundraising ideas and one thing that we know really works is whatever site you have if you put a donate now um, button on a site it might be one way to raise money for the um, the double up food stamp benefits mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be much okay. right. yes uh, I had a question uh, several times during the presentation uh, one of the challenges you referenced were regulations and so I was just wondering um, talk a little bit more about those regulations of perceived barriers or real barriers of food safety or other things. Well um, um, yeah. Uh, Adele? Adele. Okay. Okay. One of the Julian Yeah. Uh, so I talked to Joe Bukowski. Yes. I always mispronounce his last name. Um, but he and I had an interesting conversation, and he talked a lot about things that, unfortunately, I didn't have time to research um, in a lot of depth. But one thing that he did uh, name as a concern for him, and for a lot of farmers, I'm sure, is the lack of support that he gets for um, increasing the value in his product. So when he adds value to a product, there is a law that I guess was pulled out from like 1938 in the Depression era that um, then makes him liable for a big tax from the government. And so there's a lot of issues around increasing the value to his product as well as bringing in extra infrastructure um, and increasing his tax um, dollar requirements because of that, and that came up in this too. So he was talking a lot about uh, what, what farmers have to face when they want to add value to their products but can't because of this kind of like double-edged sword of regulation. 
um, and he brought up a good example about um, processing cider in New York and how the governor of New York provided a benefit for this amazing apple crop that we had this year and farmers were really excited about it and they made all this cider and they made hard cider and they did all these cool things and then the Department of Agriculture um, pulled out this old law from 1938 and, and taxed the crap out of them. And they were kind of like, wait, what? Because the government, like the New York State government told us to do this and then we get taxed. So. Another piece here, though, uh, regulations related to how food is handled if it can be served in a school. So, um, you know, there are rules about after the produce is harvested, it has to be covered. So if a, a local farmer has their produce out on the truck for too many hours, then, it's, then it can't be sold to a school. That's my understanding. That's one small example of um, how the regulations can interfere with getting local food into um, schools and nursing homes, for example. As well as looking at safety about, uh, for example, high-risk populations can only be served pasteurized eggs. Um, that's one example of health and safety concerns where certain people can only be served certain foods that are highly uh, processed in some way, as well as um, farmers being certified in certain agricultural practices to be able to even sell their products to certain institutions. Um, and those are bureaucratic hoops that have to be jumped through that are very expensive to get certified in and involve a lot of paperwork. I mean, a hot on the topic, obviously, is, is GAP. We know we're that. Yeah, you know, and good agricultural practices yeah. Are, yeah. are certainly an issue here. Um, that's that's another Jeff, piece. <coughs> well, I think this is a very important point. I think this is a, a stumbling <coughs> block. I think everybody has to be aware. And I think, John, you would agree. They had a meeting, I think, at Wally Zukowski's farm this summer about this. All these things we hear about going on out west, especially on, well, that one in Colorado with the spoilage of, uh, I forgot what Can't it was. Uh, you have no idea about at the federal level what's happening. You know, they're imposing these rules. Uh, at this point, they're not imposed, but they're going to be, possibly, on the Northeast, where our farming uh, footprint is entirely different. Uh, and I think everybody needs to be aware of that uh, with their congressional delegations. Uh, to let them know, support, go to these meetings if you hear about them understand what's going on because this is a big thing the bottom line and i've said this all along is if a guy that wants to get into agriculture or a woman whatever whoever it might be if that can't make a living at it they're not going to do it and everything you brought up tonight i think there's some great ideas about the farmers market that might have to be done more on a regional scale for example in northampton one of the biggest problems is a lot of the farmland is being bought up by fellows that started small and that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So to try to get land that's productive and farm it is really hard. Not because farming, you know, the bigger, they, a lot of these guys have found the bigger you get, the more, uh, there's a little bit better, you know, profit to employ people and, and that sort of thing. It's just been a process of a long time to get to this point. But number one, guys got to make a living. Farmland is a little tight, uh, trying to get something. The idea about productive farmland in Northampton, it takes money to make farmland productive. Uh, that's a big thing. So it all plays into the fact that just like anybody else in this room, everybody wants a job, everybody wants to make a decent living. The bottom line is that this person can make a living and can market its produce, and I think this is what this is all about. We're up and on our way. But the big thing is that I think they have to make uh, these are Thank you. Yes. Um, I was First of all, thank you so much for this work. It's incredible. I really appreciate your commitment and uh, the depth with which you did it. Um, I was struck by one thing, and it seems like there was a lot of talk about the SNAP, the doubling the SNAP benefits, and I think that's a really important uh, piece for moving beyond kind of the upper middle class culture around, you know, this appreciation of local food. And I, I was just, I was struck by um, most of the recommendations really focusing on kind of culturally on people who are of um, more means and how do we shift culturally beyond just 
making food more local food more available through SNAP benefits, mm -hmm. how do we mm. shift the actually shift cultures to embrace this concept beyond um, beyond SNAP? So, and I was I was also thinking about I didn't see in the recommendations too much about um, school based education. Um, yeah, actually yeah. Rebecca has developed a school curriculum yeah. um, that would be fantastic for Northampton Public Schools, and that's something we certainly um, looked at, and I want to make it very clear that those workshops that we did, we suggested are something that is inclusive to all different types of mm -hmm. people, and um, it's something that we hope to draw on the whole community, and that's yeah. certainly a topic in our, our class that we've discussed at length. Oh, Rebecca definitely. can speak specifically to her visit to the Northampton Public Schools. Oh, yes, definitely. So, uh, actually, Haley, where, oh, <laughs> Haley and I uh, visited the Northampton uh, High School, and we spoke to some of the professors there. Uh, one was Ms. Armstrong, who teaches uh, the health and nutrition courses there, and then Ms., oh, I just forgot her name. Oh, but uh, the one who, who also does the... Uh, uh, the oh, culinary yeah. arts yeah. Uh, classes and definitely there is a lot of enthusiasm from students I mean her the the uh, health and nutrition class is a, uh, a mandatory course that's offered two times uh, one fo and and that only focuses a little bit on nutrition but within that course she does focus on the importance importance of, of uh, fresh produce and eating locally and then uh, but then the culinary arts <coughs> classes are electives and one of the great things about those is that they have um, financial assistance which allows them to offer their students the, uh, the opportunity to explore new ingredients and, and to go uh, either harvest from their school garden or go into town and find these ingredients that they never would have seen in their households or experienced mm -hmm. otherwise and then they can take it into the classroom and really experiment with it and, and learn how to use it and then but definitely one of the main ideas behind this uh, this curriculum is definitely access you know because I mean one thing that that my background and interest in food is definitely working with parents to uh, figure out ways to make meals affordable and convenient because I know you know it, if you're a working parent you're coming home and it's like you know, you don't you don't have the time to to make this huge meal and gourmet food, and it's it's really uh, you know working working with parents and, and developing uh, skills that will allow them to not only afford it and and also bringing in um, knowledge about the different programs because there are benefit programs out there. It's just knowing who to go to, how to use them, and stuff like that. So. I don't know. If that yeah, certainly. If you're interested in reading that curriculum, I encourage you to all look online. Um, once the final report um, is posted toward the start of the the coming new year, so um, that's something that will definitely be included in our report and open for the public to read. Also, there are some uh, smaller programs where school children are brought out to farms to do some gleaning, and then they cook the food and prepare it in various ways and bring it home to their families. So that's another way of introducing um, novel or unusual, healthy, fresh food uh, yeah. to people who might not otherwise ever eat it. Yeah, definitely. There, there, we have some uh, other local programs, I mean, within Massachusetts. Uh, one is in Mount Holyoke, it's, I'm forgetting the names, but yeah, in, in our paper we have some other uh, kind of models for this, which, which I found really fascinating. Yeah. Bill. I'm Bill White, the Northampton City Council, and I'm, I heard how the municipality can help. I'm not sure if I heard or understand the regulations that might be serving as an impediment that are municipal regulations or limitations. I was wondering if someone could fill me in on that. Uh, Adele, did you want to address that? <laughs> I, 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 know, I know the assessor's part came up, and, and it should be noted that we don't set the criteria for assessment. The city doesn't do that. We only set the rate. The assessments are actually prescribed by state statute. We can't 
arbitrarily decide where we assign our values. And that's that's not entirely up to us. Uh, that, that came up in the survey of farmers, and it was just listed as you know, regulations. But I'm not sure that I ever understood what the regulations were. But John, you know? and for the assessor's situation, the, the state designates certain farm things as different values. And basically, most assessors across the state accept this. One of the biggest problems has been up in South Deerfield in the last few years, where there's been a few exceptional sales of land. So the assessors has gone and up the rates far beyond the scope of what the state has set. So I think that's where the, the biggest problem is. And, and other farming communities are, are concerned about this as a trend that may happen. So basically, it's the values that the assessors are putting on the land, even though the state designates pasture land as this, crop land as this, you know, pay field to something else. And I think the other regulation piece, though, that a lot of them were speaking about was land use. Um, you know, and zoning, and what you know, what you can use your land for, and what you can't, and what comes in the bundle of rights that you know go along with your land. And I think some people are, would like to see some more flexibility um, in terms of, of land use. I think maybe that's something that was wrapped into the regulations piece when it comes to the municipality itself. Um, any anything any anything specifically? I mean, John actually talked to a point that if, to the if, to the extent that we have some influence on at least keeping the assessor program. And a case in point now, for example, in North Hampton, uh, for example, you can't, you can't apply for Chapter 61A uh, classification for your land unless you have five contiguous acres. Okay, now what's happening is, and I can see it in this room, I see it as the Ag Commission itself, is that in the Northeast, uh, we're getting into smaller farms. So, again, you're going to take away from your tax rolls by going to 61A in less than five acres. But on the other hand, if you get some tax relief uh, and you can get some uh, money flowing through produce and, and maybe do something, for example, with generating a, a place for people who have a common farmer's market, that little thing alone might help. <laughs> and the other thing is, just what John said, keep aware of what's going on in South Deerfield because there's no reason in the world why they couldn't raise assessment on 61A land. One of the things we saw in the agricultural farmer survey is the extreme fragmentation of a lot of farms, where a lot of you are just farming little pieces of land in different places so you don't meet that criteria for five particular things. Yeah, the, the trend is actually downward. I mean, there's less farmland being farmed now in the state than it was 10 years ago, but there's like 200 more farms. So, I mean, do the math. I mean, <laughs> they're getting smaller. And uh, there wasn't a lot of discussion of husbandry. <coughs> and I, I know, you know, we've, we've lost virtually every dairy farm in the western part of the state. Uh, oh, and, and in relatively quick short order. I, I recognize the intensity of use and land in dairy processing, the associated costs and all of that, but clearly there is a market force for local um, <coughs> dairy production, meat production, mm -hmm. that, that would probably give a, a, a broader spectrum of options for local purchasers. Uh, is there something a municipality can do to promote that. I mean, I mean, this is basically my bailiwick. I don't have any authority beyond municipal governance other than just be like you and rail against the inequities of the system that we, that we struggle against. But we do have some influence, and, if, and, and I need to know somewhat more specifically how we can not only help promote, which I've heard about, but also how we can also facilitate. Mm -hmm. And right. I think a lot of the regulations that we're talking about are not city regulations. Right, I understand. They're, they're, they're ways that the city has to respond to state and federal regulations, which is, which is awful. <laughs> right, I mean, yeah. right now there's a much bigger meat market in, for local meat in the area than there is production. The throttle point is where it's processed. I mean, there's very few processing points. Everything's generated right now through the, the USDA, the the Farm Bureau and some other agencies are trying to get it so that the state has more control over this so that the process will be more streamlined and they'll be able to open up more ways to process the local meat so that it'll be available to the people. 
because right now it's going to Vermont, it's going to New Hampshire, it's going to Rhode Island. And I've talked to people that said, you know, you used to be able to say, I'm going to send up something in a couple of weeks, no problem. Now they're going to schedule a year ahead because that's how far the backup is. So, I mean, that's, that's one of the biggest problems is processing the product that they want. Didn't they open one up in Athens? Yeah, but that's... They have, a mobile, yeah, they have a mobile slaughtering house as well. There's right. actually a great CISA report on this. Fantastic. And if you would like to, to see the, you know, the recommendations that you even have there um, in the study you've done, we read that study and, and looked at it, and we were struggling in our class considerably with the issue of meat. We talked about it at length, and it, we decided that we didn't, we didn't think we were all that prepared to take the, on that problem solving process. Um, that being said, doesn't, it doesn't mean that there aren't steps to be taken. Um, and I encourage you to read CISA's report regarding meat in the valley um, and certainly regarding, you know, distribution or slaughtering really, you know, and processing and, um, and distribution after that is, are, are all issues. And I can add that from our surveys, there was a lot of interest, in particular, yes. in meat. Yes. They wanted more fresh local meat. Yes. Yeah. And the price was an issue there as well. Yeah. And there is Sutter's is opening up in a month in downtown Northampton on King Street, and they're sourcing local meat, and uh, local farmers are sending most of their animals to Athol, and they'll pick it up, you know, after it's been killed, and they'll be making the cuts on that. So we'll see how that new the, model goes. A lot yeah. of the collapse of the local dairy farm is based on uh, a, a regional or if not, uh, national levels of, uh, there's price supports, uh, governmental price supports that yeah. started back in the 30s in the Depression to try to maintain uh, some kind of a sense uh, to give, uh, and, and a lot of this, uh, there was a Northeast Dairy Compact that collapsed because we just didn't the have the, no, the, the votes. Federal government and did that. Pardon? The federal government had something in the ending of that. Right. Yeah. We didn't have the votes to counteract it. Though. Right. You see, the, the, our congressional delegation didn't have uh, in, in the Northeast didn't have the power to, to. But it's just so ironic because we've got a heavy population concentration here in the East Coast and in the Northeast, and it just seems to me that as the price of fuel goes higher and higher and higher. This whole meeting, everybody here tonight realizes that. I think that as time goes on, we're going to need more access to local food just to protect our, ourselves. Yeah. And, and, and this is what we, the more people that are aware of this, the more educated we can get on this, the more we can tell our congressmen uh, about this and, and, and push them. Well, one of the so big things right now is the is the farm bill not being passed. I mean, that may be a collapse of the dairy prices. There may be a spike in milk, anyways, because that's basically determined of how much how much it costs to make cheese in Wisconsin determines the price of milk for the country. Exactly. So that's why you know in Wisconsin is a little yeah. bit different doing dairy than it is here in New England. So very complex, very complicated <laughs> situations, not very easily resolved. And in the short term, we'd love to see more land protected so that in the future when we move to make substantive change in um, those types of, you know, harder issues, that the land's still there. Mm -hmm. That's really key, that the land is still there and there is someone there interested in farming it. Well, you do know that, uh, particularly through the Office of Planning and uh, Sustainability, that uh, we've done a very aggressive mm -hmm. Certainly. campaign of retaining all the all the arable land in the, in, the, in the valley so it doesn't go to development and housing intensity. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think we, I don't think you'll find much pushback from, on the municipal side as far as this goes. Fran is a former city councilor and former conscience of the city council. And, and we are predisposed to do this. Um, I, I need to have, at least myself, and I'm sure the mayor as well, need to have a better understanding. What I, I want to know what impediments we set up, and I think I've got a sense of that now on some level. And we certainly have a sense of what the recommendations are. Um, and, and, you know, Phil actually laid out some of the challenges for some of those. But that's that's okay, because we don't step on ideas. We we massage them. <laughs> 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 I, 
I think we should probably be kind of close this at around nine. I mean, that was kind of what we had in mind. So uh, maybe one or two more questions. Maybe one more question. Does any or comment, Jerry? Um, I'm. I was president of the Ward Three Neighborhood Association, and Ward Three includes the Meadows. And over the years, I've had calls from a number of people, particularly some younger folks, who wanted to get into farming and wanted to know if there was any land available for farming. I had no idea where to send them. I don't know if there's any registry. I don't know if there's any, you know, website where people who have land to rent put it up on a website. Whether there's, if it is, it's a well-kept secret and it needs to be publicized because there are young people out there. The average age of our farmers is, is increasing. There's a lot of young people who want to get into it, but they don't know how to access land, as Mr. Jeske was saying. It's a very, that's a very tough issue. And it, I think more work needs to be done on making sure that people who want to get into it can get land. Did you want to comment on that? Uh, do you want to comment? Oh, basically, you can call CESA, you, you can call a lot of groups and we can give them the information. There's a lot of referrals for that. There's a beginning farmers network statewide. So there are places to go to see if there's land available. You can start with us if you want. There is a website called NewEnglandFarmlandFinder.org, which is a product of the other linking organizations in all six states. And it's, it's picking up steam and it's, it's uh, I think it would be very useful. <laughs> You want to have yeah, thank you all for coming, and I wanted to express the fact that us 10 students, as well as Adele and Fran and some others here who have been very involved in the Keep Farming Initiative are here. If you'd like to ans ask questions specifically to any one of the groups, um, we invite you to do so. We'll, s we'll be here. We're not leaving Northampton until May. So please, please, please reach out to us. And if you have a bright idea or you have something you want to move forward um, with, we, got a, we have a lot of energy here and a lot of dedication, and we've put our heart and soul into this, as has you know, every other player in this, and it's been a joy and truly special to, to collaborate with each group in the, the Keep Farming Initiative. And yeah. we so appreciate all of your hard work. Um, and, and wanna, look forward to moving forward with, with these I, recommendations. And I want to add a word, too, of not only of thanks to all of you, but I've been sort of listening to all of this yeah. tonight. And um, it seems to me that a lot of what we've said is already known. Uh, We've already sort of aware of the problems, and we're aware of a lot of the possibilities. I think one of the things this group has done is to put some numbers on that, uh, which is always a helpful thing to do, it seems to me. Uh, but we know that we will go forward inch by inch, that there will be some progress here and a step back here, and there will always be problems. If there weren't problems, it would be done. Uh, but when I try to step back and take a much longer view, um, I see some trends that I think probably most of you see too. Uh, one of them is I, I've noticed that the Christmas shopping this year is almost all online. A huge amount of it is online. Just in the last very few years, we have become such an outsourcing economy, such a dot-com economy. And that has so many implications for small towns and small cities like us, because what we have to concentrate on to be what we want to be is what cannot be outsourced. And when I look at that in terms of Northampton, I see an incredibly beautiful environment we live in a wonderful place that has rich soils. Even though we've lost some of that farmland, there's still a good deal of it here, and we may be able to get some more if we keep working on it. Um, we have a responsive city government. Not every place can vouch for that. Um, we have a good arts community that's local, that you can build on and interact, and, and this whole local food thing can be a real driver in this overall community effort to bring our lives home again and to work with 
all these people in the community who are so engaged and so eager to have a, an accessible and democratic and homegrown culture here. So I'm very hopeful, and I hope you are too. Thank you.